All right, you're probably wondering why there's so many pipes out here. Um, back in um, back in 1985, 80, well, actually earlier than that, 83, 84, um, we uh, we had we had dis we had discovered the sewage plume. We were beginning to get a feeling for what it looked like and everything else. And um, one of the big questions at the time in, in the hydro groundwater hydrology was the rate at which contaminants disperse. You know, how, how quickly will it, if you put in a, if you had a spill from a septic tank or a, you know, fuel spill or whatever else, and, and, and it got in the aquifer and it begins to migrate with the natural groundwater flow, how quickly would it get diluted and dispersed to the point where it wouldn't be a problem? Uh, and uh, there were a lot of ideas about how quickly that happened and what caused it. And what they, um, what a number of uh, folks were able to demonstrate um, is that um, uh, the primary cause of the dispersion in groundwater, unlike in surface waters or in the atmosphere, which is turbulence, there's no turbulence in groundwater, it moves too slowly. You probably you know, heard about laminar flow, it's really kind of almost laminar, is, is the uh, actual heterogeneity of the subsurface. In other words, even the most uniform quote unquote aquifer, like a sand and gravel outwash like this is, actually has a fair amount of lensing and layering because it's a natural geologic deposit. You know, it has beds, you know, sedimentation beds from, from running water. So um, some, some uh, pioneers like Lynn Gelhar, I don't know if Lynn Gelhar comes into the lab at all or not. Anybody know Lynn Gelhar, professor at MIT? He's retired now. Um, was one of the people who actually was able to demonstrate how you could predict the rate of dispersion if you could characterize the heterogeneity of the aquifer. So if you could find some way of statistically characterizing how the hydraulic conductivity varied from place to place and how long the lenses and layers were and how thick they were, uh, that you could actually predict how rapidly contaminants would disperse. So he and, and a few others had come up with various stochastic uh, uh, models of that process. And the idea was, that, you know, was there any reality to them at all? So um, we teamed up with uh, uh, Professor Gelhar at MIT, uh, one of his PhD students, Lynn Gelhar, uh, Steve Garabedian and I and a few others uh, that we hired to help us out and we ran a tracer experiment to try to measure the rate of dispersion in the aquifer. So our idea was we would create our own little plume and we would monitor it as it moves through the aquifer and actually by collecting water samples in three dimensions. So we'd have a detailed 3D snapshot of this tracer plume that we could actually measure how rapidly it dispersed and spread and then we could compare that to other measurements of the aquifer's heterogeneity and see if the theories were right. So it was, a, it was a, a, a massive tracer experiment. So what we did is um, we picked this spot. Somebody had asked me, why did you pick this spot? Uh, well, we, we picked this spot to run the tracer experiment for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was an abandoned gravel pit. And uh, so it was flat and, and easy to work in. Secondly, it was on state-owned land, so we had permission to do it. And thirdly, uh, the groundwater was already contaminated here because of the sewage disposal. So we were able to get permission from the state to create our own plume within a plume. You know, if we had gone to a pristine aquifer, they would have gone, what are you, nuts? You want to add a contaminant? You know, so, uh, so we were able to do it right here. So what we did on, uh, in July 1985, we uh, see the three wells with the th yellow labels up there? The three wells? Those are all screened uh, just below the water table. They're shallow wells. We, uh, we pumped 2,000 gallons of water out of the aquifer into tanks. You know, this was clean groundwater, pristine groundwater. We added a number of tracers to the water, and in particular, the one I'll talk about today is bromide, uh, like chloride. It's very non-reactive, so it's a good tracer of the water, and bromide levels in the aquifer naturally are very low, so we had a good signature of the water we put in as opposed to the background water, right? And then we, uh, we injected it over a very short period of time, about a day, took about, a, about 19 hours, into those three wells. So what we did is we created a pulse, you know, on the time scale of years, essentially instantaneous, pulse in the aquifer, a bromide cloud. And uh, if you just did some simple calculations, it would have been about four meters by four meters by three meters. Now, it didn't go in that, didn't go in like a beautiful box, but that was roughly the size we expected it to be, all right? And then what we did is we then let the natural flow carry it downstream. How did we know which way it would go? We'd done all those water table wells first. We had mapped the water table out here in detail, and we could predict which direction it would take, more or less, all right? And uh, so then we started to track it. And the way we did that was by using these multi-level samplers that we had drilled out ahead of it, right? So you can just imagine this process. We, um, we inject the tracer and we had put in about 10 rows of samplers and we would come out here and look at them. Wow, look at all those wells, isn't that cool? There were about 80 of them at the time. And um, uh, we injected the tracers and then uh, right away, I think the first time we did a sampling was 13 days later, we went out and sampled as many of these multi-level samplers as we could. 
ran back to the lab and then analyzed the samples for bromide and tried to figure out where this tracer cloud was. How big was it? And on that basis, we then would build more samplers, get out ahead of where the cloud was going to go next based on our predictions, drill more samplers, and then we leapfrogged for two years that way, all the way down across the gravel pit. So all these samplers were put in as part of that tracer test uh, back in 1985. Um, are these all multi-level? These are all multi-level samplers. So you're looking at uh, a well field here. There's, we've now since run about 70 tracer experiments out here, so we've added some as we go along. There's about 1,000 out here, which means there's 15,000 sampling points in the gravel pit. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I would guess uh, it's hard. It's hard to, to really put a number on it, but uh, let's just say a million dollars. I mean, I just I have no way of really telling you because it's old dollars versus new dollars, and you know, it's really hard to say. And then we had a lot of researchers work with us, but I didn't control their money. You know, I didn't fund them, so uh, my budgets were always less than a half a million. They were they were uh, typically a couple hundred thousand. But then that was in 1984 dollars, you know, so I don't know what it would be today. So did you prove the stochastic model? Uh, it came out uh, frequently close. Um, the one thing that surprised us was that the heterogeneity was much, even though it looks heterogeneous, when you, I, I was going to dig a pit for you today, and I said, no, I'm not digging a pit for them today. But uh, it looks very, very heterogeneous when you look at the lenses and layers, but it's not that, from a hydrologic point of view, it's pretty uniform. Um, and then we ran another test in 95, 93 to 95, another large-scale test where we did different reactive species, but we again did bromide and got a very similar number. Uh, so, um, uh, and it matched up again the stochastics pretty well. So, uh, in fact, a number of MIT, I think, I want to tell you three MIT PhD theses arose out of this test. Um, so, uh, you know, it was a fair number of MIT, MIT folks who were involved, uh, mainly Lynn Gelhar students. Um, and um, so the way we sample them, you can imagine trying to sample this. The way we sample them, you can imagine we come out here and we got to take a snapshot of where the cloud is. And, and we had a team of five of us. We had two carts like this. Um, and um, instead of sampling one tube at a time, we would hook up the milking machine like this. And we had a chart that told us how much water we had to purge out to get rid of the old water. And we would turn on the milking machine. And they would all start to pump if we're lucky. Okay. And. Um, so the person would sit here, they, were the, they, were the, they would attach the milking machine and run the cart. And in order not to pump too much out of any one port, because some yield really well, you had little clips where you could stop the flow on one that was getting ahead of the others. Okay? And we had these 60 milliliter bottles here. What we would do is we would shove these in here, and these were our rinse racks. So let's say the chart said at this distance with this depth, we need to pump out about 300 milliliters before you can take a sample. We knew that was, say, five rinses. So we would shove this in. We would fill them up. When one side of the fill up, we'd close it off. When we had them all filled, we would do this, dump it off, it would go into a bucket, you'd shove it back in until you did your rinses. Then the person behind, who was the bottle capper, and the, that's their job, they cap bottles for four days straight, um, would have loaded a rack with the sample bottles in. You'd shove that in, fill your bottles up, give it to them, they'd cap them all like a madman while you went on to the next one. And we would do that. Uh, and we had, uh, so we had two carts, and then we had the field general, um, Anybody live at McCormick? No, that's an undergraduate dorm, I guess, right? You know Kathy Hess? Yeah. Yeah. Kathy Hess is the house mother at McCormick, right? Or whatever you guys dorm? House master. She's my house. She's my coworker. I call her the house mother. Uh, uh, there were some times when we sampled 300 multi-level samplers, three samples each port, in three days, so we could really fly, take a snapshot. We did that, I think, 18 times in the course of two years. Very quickly, because we didn't have much time. We had to get it going right away. We also went to the University of Waterloo, who had done some similar experiments, and um, and you know really borrowed a lot of their ideas, to be to be honest. So, uh, you know, we won't go into it in any more detail than that. Uh, just to give you a sense for how it worked, um, on page 10, it just shows you, uh, and 11 just shows you a couple of the results. Um, the uh, and I, I won't go any further than that, except to say that. What we discovered was when you injected the tracer, as I mentioned before, it was a pretty small volume. Within 30 days, the tracer cloud was already pretty large. In fact, uh, why don't we get, uh, we might as well do this. It won't take a second. See if I can figure this out here. Hey, Pete, can I send you up as a runner? You bet. And Eric? 
I want you to find. I want you to go up to uh, row uh, one up there at the beginning, and I want Eric to find row 17. It'll say 17 on the covers. Faster, faster. Think of them as little bromides. <laughs> Okay, so there you go. So by, by 33 days, the tracer cloud had moved from those injection points to where the, the one milligram per liter contour would have been this far no south and that far north. So it spread very, very rapidly, you know, in a, in a short period of time. So by 33 days, this cloud was already like 100 feet long. But very, very narrow. It never got very narrow. And then they migrated forward at a rate of one and a half feet per day. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Pete, go to row 20. And Eric, you got to go to row 37. I think I have to leapfrog you. <laughs> so by 139 days, row 27. Actually, it's going to be beyond all of us here, I think. To row, uh, what did I tell you? No, you're 20, and he's 37. We're in the. We're all bromides. So you can see how how quickly it it, it uh, spread in the longitudinal direction, and that's exactly what the stochastic theory said. That most of the spreading should take place in the direction of flow, and the plume actually never got very wide horizontally, and in, in the vertical it stayed very very narrow. Uh, it was only about uh, uh, six or seven meters thick. There he is. So that's how that's how long on the 139th day our sampling had to encompass all the samples from beyond Pete to beyond Eric, and that was only in 139 days. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we always did it with five people. We always did it with five people. No, we just we just worked an extra day. Yeah, we just worked faster. We got pretty good at it. We were damn good at it. We collected 100,000 water samples for the experiment.